Thanks, Bill. 18 years, and this will be the 19th, by the way. <laughs> but, who, but who's counting? Uh, well, listen, welcome, everyone, and thank you all for uh, taking the time to join us today. Uh, we are going to start out the day, as you saw from the agenda, with um, a, a couple of presentations to sort of get the, the juices flowing here. But uh, after the break, we IBMers are going to basically shut up and start listening. Uh, the most important thing for us here today is to hear from our clients and our thought leaders from government and academia uh, to sort of teach us about what's important to you and so that we can make sure that our research agenda, our go forward agenda for IBM is consistent with uh, your thinking. So please do not be shy. Uh, do not just listen and take notes today. Please give us your feedback and your thoughts on what we should be working on. As you heard from the videotape, uh, we have a very powerful organization around the globe in IBM Research uh, that we can aim over important targets. And we're looking for what those important targets are for the future. So I'd like to just share with you some thoughts, again, on some technologies that we think are important going forward that we're working on. But this, by no means, is uh, a comprehensive view of what we're working on in our laboratories or uh, what we think is important going forward. Uh, but I wanted to, to, to uh, give you some, some ideas and perhaps get some, some thoughts going here. Uh, before I do, though, I just I can't resist, before I look forward, looking back. And when you look at the last um, 100 years or so of information technology, the influence has been pervasive. Uh, not only has it influenced our own you know, personal lives, but it has influenced industries. Um, whether it's, it's banking, insurance, retail, every one of those industries in some way has been touched and in many cases transformed by the evolution and in many cases revolutions that information technology has brought to bear. And of course, IBM has played a role in this. Uh, as you know, uh, we are now, in a sense, wrapping up our centennial year our 100th year of the IBM company, which is a, um, an amazing feat, an absolutely amazing feat uh, in a, in a, in a high-tech, rapidly changing world for a company uh, to be able to go from mechanical tabulators through computer systems into the future of large, intelligent analytic systems is absolutely incredible. And as you heard, uh, from Jim McGrady, not many companies or labs have made it through those many transitions. So if you think back 100 years to mechanical switches, uh, through punch cards, uh, these are all areas where IBM led and applied those technologies uh, for our clients and businesses. And as you again heard from the videotape, many, many breakthroughs. I wanted to show this chart because it is, it is really equally fundamental to the high quality people we have here in IBM, IBM Research, and that's the commitment of the company. And it's not just a, a commitment to have an interesting research lab, as I think Ralph said, uh, up on a hill, but it is really core to the IBM corporate strategy that we are going to differentiate and survive or prosper or fail based on innovation. And we're putting all of our chips on that number, if you will. And to do that, I think it's, it's uh, you know, very informative to look at this quote from our current CEO and chairman, but I could find similar ones for every CEO and chairman of the IBM company throughout its 100 years that looks something like this. And I think it's this, this understanding of the deep contributions of research and development which have caused this company not only to survive but prosper over those 100 years. And hopefully will continue uh, to help us in the next, next decade. And so as you see, Sam, Sam has a very, very deep appreciation of the value of R&D, and not only uses these words, but he puts $6 billion a year, puts his money where his mouth is, behind uh, this statement, even through some of the roughest economic times uh, we've seen in decades. Now, transitioning from that, that statement closer to the technology then, um, as I've thought about uh, how technology has evolved and the rate and pace of it over the last century or over the last third of a century, which is my career, um, 
It's very interesting to think about the fact that we are, in technology, driving exponential curves. And we often forget this because we're used to looking at semi-log plots, right, which are nice straight lines of exponentials. Uh, because we like linear things. That's, we're used to a linear world that we live in. But these are exponential curves. And when you look at overall an exponential curve over a century, underneath that are, are several exponential curves that are the result of breakthrough technologies, incremental development, followed by breakthrough technologies, followed by incremental development, and on and on and on. And it's that, that fundamental of research for breakthroughs, development for incre incremental improvement, which, if tuned right in our industry, can result in tremendous success. If not tuned right, or if you do R but not D, or D but not R, you're going to have a very short life in our industry because exponential curves will either put you way ahead of your competition or kill you. Uh, there is no, there's no in between. And of course, the field is littered with companies who, who really don't get this very s simple uh, concept. Now, in the spirit then of disruptive technologies, uh, what I'd like to do is talk about four areas which uh, we think are extremely important. Uh, to our future and the future of information technologies and application of it to our clients. And in, in showing this, this chart, uh, again, back to the exponential thought, we're talking about three to six orders of magnitude improvement in these areas. So when we think about the implications of these kinds of improvements, uh, which will occur in our lifetimes, uh, these are big deals. These are really big deals. So I'd like to talk about each of these, starting at the very lowest level, deep into the nanotechnology, where that is going, the implications of that, up into the system level, where we're going to go by 1,000x performance within the next decade, up into the data layer, which is going to grow by three to six orders of magnitude in the next uh, decade or so, and then what we think is a very, very fundamental shift which is occurring, and we're in the very early stages of this, and Watson is uh, really an early glimpse at where systems are going into uh, deep, deep analytical systems which will evolve into machines that learn and uh, ultimately will be more cognitive than programmable uh, in their nature. So let me talk about each, each one of these, uh, starting with nanotechnology. Our most powerful machines, the Power 7 systems, which w are the, the brains, if you will, behind Watson, uh, have roughly one trillion transistors on a single chip, chip being about the size of your, your thumbnail. That billion transistor chip is going to be a trillion device, uh, device within the next decade or so. Think about three orders of magnitude in the device performance at, at the lowest level. Sounds, sounds difficult, but in this area of exponentially improving technologies, how, do you, how are we going to get three orders of magnitude? Well, the world is changing on us. We have ridden the last 50 plus years on a very simple silicon device. That silicon device has probably got about a decade or so left before we need to transition into other materials. And I'm not out to make you all experts in, in semiconductors on this chart, but fundamentally at each node now, we are having to reinvent the structure itself, and ultimately, as we go to single digit nanometer dimension devices, we're going to have to shift out of silicon into completely new carbon-based devices. This is a, uh, a very, very complex area and a very, very challenging area, one that we're investing uh, heavily in. But this is the roadmap to trillion, trillion switch, if you will, tr trillion device uh, performance. Interestingly, we're not only working in research in those switching devices for our computer systems, but we're finding areas around this which are very, very interesting areas uh, to invest in and do research. One example is something we call a DNA transistor, which we're working with the Roche Corporation to commercialize. The goal here is to be able to map the human genome for an individual for $1,000 or less. 
Today, that's a very complicated thing to do and a long thing to do in a wet process. A uh, team here in research has invented a device which is basically a layer of uh, nanomaterials with a nano uh, hole drilled through it where we have the ability to step a single strand of DNA through that device and read the strand of DNA so that we can now, uh, as we commercialize this, achieve that goal of $1,000 or less for mapping a genome. That will be a key to true personalized medicine and healthcare uh, going forward. Think of the amount of data, by the way, that that device is going to create uh, as we start mapping uh, genomes, individual genomes. The second is an area, again, where our research team in Amidin, we work routinely in nanoparticles, nanomaterials. Well, we're now at the, the size and structure where the nanomaterials are on the same scale as biological cells. And in this case, a uh, very interesting uh, phenomenon occurs with a certain class of polymer, uh, polymer nanoparticles, uh, which are on the same scale as bacteria. And in this case, the team has worked on uh, a material that has the ability to be attracted to and penetrate the cell wall of a staph infection bacteria. Uh, this is a whole new way of uh, potentially treating uh, bacteria which have the ability to become very antibiotic resistant, to do it mechanically, if you will, with, a, in a sense, a silver bullet. Moving up into the system layer, here again we're going to go through three orders of magnitude in improvement in performance within, hopefully, the next decade. Today we're at a petascale, or a billion times a million, uh, calculations per second, uh, moving up into exascale technology. To do that, we need not only evolutionary development, but multiple revolutionary technologies. Why is that? Well, if we're going to go a factor of a thousand in performance, we need to go, we need to have substantial improvement and reduction in power consumption uh, per calculation or we're going to go from megawatts to drive these systems to gigawatts, which means you fundamentally, next to your supercomputer, need a nuclear reactor. Can't do that. So we need significant breakthroughs. We need significant breakthroughs in the core processors, in the software architectures, the memory structures. Memory is actually turning out to be one of the largest power cons consumptions in these systems, as it is in, uh, in portable devices. We need to leverage photonics, light versus electrons, in these systems at a much, much higher rate than we have in the past, and we need to stack them. Now, what's this mean? Not only are we going to get a factor of 1,000, but as we continue to, to drive density in these systems, to just give you sort of a, a figure of merit, shown on the left side of the chart is a current petascale uh, supercomputer. 72 racks, 72 refrigerator-sized boxes. At an exascale, those 72 racks will fit in one-third of one rack. One-third of one rack. Now, I don't know how many people will buy one-third of one rack. Hopefully, people will still buy 72 boxes and 72 uh, exaf exaflop machine. But uh, this gives you a sense for, um, for the, the incredible density improvement. Put it in a different perspective. Uh, hopefully you'll get down to see the Watson uh, computer behind, behind these uh, you know, simple podiums here at the break. Uh, it's a system that's about the size of this front stage area. That's operating today in the petascale generation. Take that system in the exascale generation, you're going to hold Watson in your hand in a module. That's what this means. Now again, I don't know whether anybody wants to hold a Watson in their hand. I suspect they're going to want a full room Watson, which is a hell of a lot smarter than the current Watson in the exascale generation. Before we get to that stage, though, of exascale generation, we are now driving towards tens and hundreds of petaflops. And to a large degree, we're doing that in partnership with the Department of, Department of Energy uh, and the various agencies and national labs that have interest in these programs. Much of what's been driving uh, our supercomputer development in the past has been 
modeling a simulation of the U.S. Uh, uh, nuclear stockpile to ensure its viability, but more and more of these systems now are going into the science area. So shown here are two examples of systems that will be delivered next year, a 10 petaflop system to Argonne National Lab and a 20 petaflop Sequoia system to Lawrence Livermore. These will be uh, some of the largest systems in the world and probably in the case of the Sequoia system, the largest system uh, any place in the world. Uh, but again, I think this is an example, uh, by the way, of the kind of partnership that we can have between government, industry, and academia to drive leadership in the United States. Moving up into data. So here we're talking about not only three orders of magnitude, but perhaps six orders of magnitude. Data is simply growing at almost uncontrolled rates. And it's not growing just in nice structured data uh, that we're used to in back office transaction processing or you know, bank accounts as an example. It's growing in unstructured data. It's growing in social media. It's growing in all sorts of domains, sensors in Smarter Planet applications. Not only is it getting bigger, but it's coming at us faster. And we need to make decisions on that data in orders of magnitude less time. So we need to go from decisions that take hours and minutes, in many cases, to milliseconds and microseconds to make decisions that are coming at us at incredible rates. So when you look at, at data, uh, this is going to be one of the biggest challenges we face. Uh, we are awash in data, but we are having difficulty extracting meaningful information from that. I show a couple of examples here. Homeland Security is, is an obvious one where whether it's video cameras or sensors in all sorts of, of areas. I mean, go down into New York or Chicago or San Francisco and just take a look at the poll. You'll see a video camera. Look at bo uh, dark boxes, white boxes, which are sensors for all sorts of activity in those cities. Uh, Homeland Security is creating in immense, immense amounts of, of information and data. Telcos. As an example, we're working with Bharti in India, the largest telecom provider in India, where the population of people on cell phones is growing by the size of the United States every year or two. Immense amounts of information that needs to be mined in real time so they can operate and, and optimize not only their operating network, but mine that information for marketing information to remain uh, competitive in their market. And then IBM Deep, uh, deep Q&A. Uh, as you'll hear uh, from Dr. Ferrucci later, uh, this, is, this is a big data machine, and it's a big data mining machine. Um, it, if, if you look at the amount of time that we had, Watson had, to answer a question, to beat these two, in a sense, almost superhuman uh, human beings, less than three seconds, about two and a half seconds, right, they have to, 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 to to understand the question, find the answer, and then decide whether it wanted to answer the question or not. That amount of time did not allow us to go to disk. It had to be all in local memory. That is going to be more the case going forward uh, than the exception. In real world situations, what we call smarter planet, we're seeing this everywhere, everywhere. The sensor data that's coming in is enormous and it's flying at us. I show an example here of, of, of energy, but I could, I could go into healthcare, I could go into retail, I could go into any uh, telco, as I said before. Uh, immense amounts of information. The other aspect of this data, which is uh, becoming enormous and flying at us in this kind of a world, is it's not only unstructured, but the data itself is very dirty and very noisy. Uh, more and more, finding the signal from the noise, as we've tried to do as electrical engineers for years, is becoming the problem in the data world, in this data-intensive world. So new techniques for cleansing data, analyzing data, um, are going to be extremely, extremely important uh, to us in the future, and I think are going to, is going to represent a whole new dimension uh, in this big data problem. Moving up then to the, the sort of top of the stack and the fourth of what I consider and we consider to be one of the, the grand challenges, if you will, is to move <clears throat> from what have classically been programmable systems, simple, if you will, calculators, to systems that 
uh, have the ability <clears throat> not only to learn or understand natural language, but behave more like this computer than you know, tons of hardware. Another interesting fact is sort of to show you why this is of such important to us, that system that you'll see down there, the Watson system, again, about the size of this stage, consumes 85 kilowatts, 85,000 watts of power. It took 85,000 watts of power to beat two guys with about 20 watts each between their ears. 85,000 watts to beat 40 watts. So something, you know, something's right up here. Not, not in this particular head, but in your head. <laughs> uh, ev evolution has figured this out. So biologically inspired uh, systems is something that we're, we're very interested in. And we need to go from these hard silicon transistor devices, which now leak like a sieve and, 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 and burn incredible amounts of energy, to things that look more like neurons and synapses. So this is a very interesting area of research. Before we get to that, though, we're sort of in early in this journey. And we, our research agenda around Watson is to very quickly move from this uh, you know, Jeopardy demonstration. By the way, this is the actual stage where the, the game was uh, taped, and that is the actual final score. Congratulations again, Dave. <laughs> Uh, if we had lost, we wouldn't be here today, by the way. I know I wouldn't be here, would I? <laughs> um, but we're now in the sort of middle mode here, which is beginning to commercialize that. We've chosen healthcare. Uh, WellPoint uh, is uh, the partner that we're working with to, to do the first uh, demonstration of commercialization uh, of this. We're delighted to have WellPoint as a partner, and I saw Lori here and the team. Uh, just. A tremendous partnership because this is not as simple as taking a bunch of code or a system and passing it off and saying, you know, good luck in your business. Uh, these are these are learning systems. These are very complex, large data systems, and it really takes a, a unique partnership to commercialize that. So this is going to be a major effort for us over the next year or two. But beyond that, we're looking at the technologies that will be required to take Watson, uh, these so, sort of uh, learning systems, to the next level. We have a lot of work to do. We have to go from uh, uh, natural language uh, input, if you will, and understanding to unstructured data. Uh, there's a lot of work we need to do around the query. Uh, there's a lot of interest in using a system like this, not just to answer questions, but to use it for discovery. Right? Teach us, we want Watson to teach us what questions to ask next as we run out of uh, questions to, to ask the system, and then get into a more uh, dialogue uh, oriented system than a, you know, a, a back and forth. So a lot of work to do on Watson. But we also look beyond just the next couple of years of Watson and, and we look way out. And here we're studying really uh, the boundaries of what might be possible with cognitive computing. So uh, just to sort of look at the numbers here, uh, look along the top, you can see, if you can read the numbers, uh, number of neurons, number of synapses. So we're, we're up in the 10 to the 14th or so uh, synapses with about a uh, factor of 1,000 or, or 10,000 less neurons, but big numbers of uh, neurons and synapses uh, between our ears operating at 20 watts. So the first thing that we're trying to do is to just simulate that number of connections or interconnects in a supercomputer. We've been doing that and making uh, great progress on that. Again, working uh, with Department of Energy and, and Dr. Koonin's team, to try to just get into a big blue gene supercomputer, the equivalent number of nodes as is in one's head, and then to start to study the behavior of a system of that scale, uh, which occurs on a biological level. And then in addition to that, in parallel, working under a, a DARPA contract, we're actually studying what kinds of devices could we physically create to mimic that kind of behavior, to mimic large arrays of interconnects that are different than what we've done in the past, and devices which behave more like a neuron than like a semiconductor switch. And here we've invented some very interesting materials which have unusually striking properties relative to similarity to, uh, to, to neurons. So huge task, long-term project, but as we get to the exascale generation, 
at 1000x, we're going to have similar number of node counts in these systems as we have, again, in a human brain. And we can start to build devices that will actually, at least in terms of numbers, look like uh, what's in a human brain. We've also made progress in building devices. Uh, very simple, you know, now we're talking 256 neuron equivalents on a chip, but uh, very low count compared to, you know, 10 to the 9th or 10th. But uh, we can now start to simulate in simple CMOS technology uh, very simple interconnect structures, and we can start to study and investigate systems that will begin to learn very simple things like shapes and patterns but begin to learn versus uh, be, be programmed. So early on, but very, very interesting uh, area of research, and I think will have profound impacts long term for us and, uh, and the world. So stepping back then and concluding, and then I, we have four or five minutes for questions. Um, we can do this because we're now 100 years old, I guess, right? But you look back and you look at the beginning of systems, computing systems, IT uh, systems. They were basically tabulating machines. They counted. And that's all the mechanical switches and the early vacuum systems. I think the second generation of computing systems uh, were programmable systems that basically have the ability, and this is, this is what we have today, the best of what we have today, are programmable systems where we have the ability to put in various equations and do various things with data, but in a programming sort of way. I think we're on the verge of a third enormous step. And these are systems that you can call them smart, you can call them cognitive, you can call them learning systems. But these are systems that will be capable of dealing with the large amounts of information that I described before, which will be many orders of magnitude more powerful than what we have today and will be constructed of materials and processes that are in the very early stages of research, hopefully many of which are down the hall in one direction here uh, in this building. But this is, this is an entirely new era. And so as you listen to our next speaker, think about not just how wonderful Watson is and the fact that it beat two human beings in an open domain questioning, but think about it as the very first step or glimpse in an entirely new realm of IT information systems moving into the future. So thank you very much for, uh, for joining us again today. And I'd be happy to take, I guess, uh, two minutes worth of questions. Thank you. Yes, Tim. making each piece vastly better than it was. Are you also thinking about backing way up and saying, maybe we should be putting new pieces together in new ways? So not taking memory and improving it, processors, but just the whole thing. We are, Tim. And um, <clears throat> we've stepped back and looked at clean sheet computing, because much of the system architecture today between processors and memory uh, et cetera, I.O. is our artifacts of that second, second generation. And I guess, you know, the, the example I showed of these cognitive devices, in, in that, that chip that I showed you, 256 neurons, there is no processor, there's no memory, there's no I.O. It's an array. So we've thrown the book out on von Neumann architecture, right? And we're looking at completely, completely new architectures. Uh, going forward. Many, many similar things are occurring in the software regime because we're going to have computing devices, programmable devices for a long time. It's pretty clear that we are going to have even more massively parallel systems in the next several decades before we can get to these other types of systems. In a sense, we have to throw out a lot of what we know about software, software architectures for those massively parallel systems. So a lot of work going on clean sheet work as well. Yes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
I've been asked that question, or something like that question a lot. Um, yeah, I think we're, again, we're, we're entering this regime of, of analytics. And I've seen glimpses of cases where the analytics has gone from rear view mirror, what has happened in extracting, to very forward looking. I'll give you a very simple example. I, that case of Barty that I talked about. It started out that Barty wanted to know in real time who, who is going to switch between carriers, between them and IDEA or any of the other big carriers in India. Turns out that in India, with the cost pressures, the switching between carriers occurs extremely rapidly. I mean, minutes, minutes. So the first thing we did for them was to build a system which in real time is looking at the traffic, the data, and determining uh, which clients um, are in the middle of switching or have just switched, you know, get to them quickly and try to get them back with some new marketing program or new deal. Very interestingly, as we collected that data and analyzed that information, we moved from looking in the rear view mirror to real time to predicting. We developed algorithms that had the ability to, based on who was talking to whom and what they were saying, we could start to predict who was likely to switch. So, you know, Bijan is a friend of Jim's, and we know when they talk and he says certain things, they're likely as a, a team to switch carriers. And so these learning systems now are just reaching the stage where we can move from real time to predictive even without having sophisticated models. You know, in, the, in science and engineering, we can do that today with models, but in the world that you're in, and some of these other people are in, in, in these real world applications, there are no models. And so we need to learn from what's happening, statistically analyze it, and then develop models on the fly for what will happen. Very, very early in that, but I'm seeing glimpses of it in a few industries. Maybe one more question, and then we'll... John. So when you talk about sensors and um, signal to noise and stuff, yes. Yeah, so, so John Cohen is from the Beacon Institute, one of our partners, uh, where we are literally instrumenting the Hudson River and in real time analyzing that information for better water management within the, the Hudson Valley. That will probably be a model for other rivers and estuaries around the world. So catch John at the break if you're interested in that. But uh, this is a classic case, as John knows, where uh, with the sensor arrays that are in the river now, we have so much information flying at us. Uh, in real time, in large quantities. We can do things like visual mapping, but uh, this again is a case where the data is very, very noisy. Uh, these sensors are putting out you know, all sorts of uh, crazy signals. So I think, John, the hardware as I showed you, that's going to happen. Okay, we're gonna create those systems. We already, I think, have sufficient hardware to deal with your Hudson River uh, input. We have the the memory structures to deal with it. Now it's about the analytics. It's analyzing that information, looking for the noise, or the signal in the noise, um, and then beginning to do predictive work. Back to the last question that says, okay, we're now starting to see this behavior in the river. Uh, we may need to do something with Indian Point nuclear reactor or something that's affecting temperature or other things occurring in the river. That's a big analytics problem with very, very noisy data where, as you know, our models are extremely primitive in terms of what happens in that river. So very, very similar case of lots of information. How do we move to a somewhat predictive world? But that's, that's where the real interesting uh, research will be.